Why, why are we scared? Because they don't know the love of God yet. We're, 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 in time we don't know love, we're scared. If you don't really know your spouse loves you, you might be scared they're going to cheat on you. If you really don't know that your, lo- your kids love you and they're listening to you, you're always afraid of what to happen. Fear is a terrible thing. But when you, love, when you understand the power of love, the Bible says it will get rid of that fear. See, the reason why Jennifer felt okay in getting up here and talking about what just happened in her life and the struggles she's had is because she's not afraid in this room. Because she feels safe in this room. She feels loved in this room. You feel loved. On Monday night, we have, I'll just call it Monday night group. We call it prayer and praise. But the truth is what happens in the middle of that praise and prayer and sharing, there becomes this atmosphere of trust and safety. And then people can do what the Bible says. The Bible says confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. Healed of what? The fault. That right there is not talking about healing of the body because the scripture before it says if there's any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. They'll pray for you. But if you've got some faults, some things way down in you, it's like the California fault line. You don't see it. And there's the beaches and Hollywood and the vineyards and the beautiful lands. There's not a, even a more beautiful state than California. I mean, it's got beautiful, it's got everything there. Beaches and mountains and the redwoods and all the things of California. But the truth is one of the most scary states because there's a big old fault line underneath it, right? And they never know when the big one's going to come. And that's how a lot of us live our lives. We look good on the outside. But underneath there's a fault line, and you never know when the big one's going to come. And there's tremors that happen, and nobody may know it but your family. But let me tell you something. It shows when you've got cracks in your foundation. And there's something about the power of confession. Everything in this kingdom, it relies on confession. So if it relies on confession, the base we've been teaching is love because I can't confess when I don't feel love because you might hurt me. I mean, y'all have told something in confidence and somebody hurt you with it. So the more you tell it, you become like that little caterpillar I was talking about. You just start binding yourself up and I ain't going to tell anybody anything. And the very walls that you have built to keep pain out also makes you very alone. It makes you miss out on the things that you didn't even know you could have fun when you were sober. We can wrap ourselves in so many things. Alcohol is just one of them. We wrap ourselves in that. It's a coping mechanism. Uh, Substance abuse is one of them. But there's many things that people wrap themselves up in prosperity, money, business. Some men, really, the only way they can feel successful is when they've got that job. And I know my husband, uh, work ethic is one thing his mother gave him. The only thing she'd ever come close to giving him any affirmation on was how well he worked. And even that, he didn't seem good enough. He said, I remember I went out there and we'd, we'd weed the whole garden. And she'd come out there and look at it and go, you missed. There's a couple blades right over there you missed. So he never felt good enough. See, those kind of things create an unsafe environment. And sometimes, even as children, our world was not safe. Because there was a lack of true love. The love that God teaches us to have. And we've been on this now since January. We've been on this thing. What is the big rocks? What's the foundational rocks? What's the stones that we're going to build our life on? What is the things that's not going to have cracks in them? We know that love, we've already discovered it. It is above all. It's above all and it's below all. It is the circle. Everything is It's going to be about love. And then Christ, the cornerstone. He's the first stone you put in there. Oh, he's solid. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All others, it's sifting sand, shifting sand. But I'm going to tell you something. When you can trust the love of God, and until you get that big rock down, you're going to have problems with trust and problems and be able to receive and give love. And this is why we talk about it so much. That's why I've been teaching on it since January, and we're not through. you got to quit being resistant to what he's trying to give you. I love what the Lord said to you. He said, when I was, I was holding you, but you didn't feel it. How many times has he been holding us, but we just didn't even recognize because we didn't feel loved. We didn't feel love. We didn't feel like you cared. 
because you were looking at things that he was trying to do to get you sober, to get you healthy, but the things he was trying to break you out of it, you didn't feel love. I tell you what, when I was spanking on my girls, get, get out of that street, get them over here, they didn't feel very loved. I was yanking them up and dragging them up across there. Uh, no, you, you're you going to be grounded this weekend, girl. You must lay three weekends in a row. You ain't going anywhere for a month. They did not feel the love, did they? I was holding them, but they didn't feel it. Because we don't understand some things. We don't understand the dimensions of love. And this is one thing. The more I've done this love thing, oh, my gosh, we could talk about the rest of the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's what makes this kingdom go around. It is the foundation. But what I thought was going to be the very first scripture, the very first thing I would teach in January when we're talking about what's the main thing. It's about your priorities. What is the big rocks? What's the foundational rocks? One of those things, we're, I'm going to talk about that fault line. Let me tell you, confession will heal your fault lines. It's, it's not like just going in and putting a little patch on it, putting some semen on it. Right now we've got a lot of potholes, don't we? Because when the weather came, what happened? Gary's going to go out there and fill some of those potholes in our, our driveway. We live out in the country, and it was good. But all of a sudden, the weather comes, you sh- it shows the cracks. It gets up underneath there. Boy, brother, I feel sorry for y'all, all those cars out your house. I see those ladies driving out there. We had like 35, 40 women out there driving around their land. I was like, oh, mud slinging, ruts in the yard. I'm sorry, brother. You must love us and let us have these things. Oh, thank you. We need a landscaper. <laughs> I thought about your yard. Oh, life has some ruts, doesn't it? There are some things. But let me tell you what he said. It won't just be going to the counselor, which I am a counselor, and I believe strongly in counselor, counseling. But let me tell you what I've discovered many times with people. We can talk, but really what we do, we just get to the fault line. And all the counseling, all the medicine, all the therapy in the world cannot really heal a broken heart. It takes the one who made the heart to heal it. It takes the one that when you say, I realize now I can confess, I've got this problem. Then all of a sudden, he said, when you would confess that and pray. In other words, you don't just confess it to anybody. It's not safe to tell your stuff to everybody. Y'all know that. But you need to have somebody in some place that you're safe enough that you can confess your faults and say, yes, I may sing on the praise team, but at night I drink by myself. I may sing on the praise team, but, or I may go to church and teach Sunday school, but I still have that pill addiction, or I still have an anger problem. I might be a deacon in the church, but you don't know how sometimes I talk to my wife and kids. See, some point you're going to have to get real and get down and say, I have some faults in my foundation. I've got some cracks that I need to be healed. See, God is not interested. He wants you to some point in your life not to have to worry about when the big one's going to come. And your family had to tiptoe around you, not knowing mama's going to be sober, daddy's going to be sober, daddy's going to be angry, daddy's going to be sad, daddy's going to be mad, daddy's going to be mad because we didn't have enough bills, pay the money bills, we're going to have anger problems, we're, or, or is, is, is mama going to cheat, daddy going to cheat, we're going to go through another divorce, we're going to move another house, we're going to be able to pay the bills. See, that kind of stuff is what happens in real life. And God is trying to get us to the place that we can have the life that he promised us, which is an abundant life. Which means not only I have peace in my home, but I have some peace to give you. I not only have some long suffering and some some joy in my home, but when I go to work, I've got some just springing off of me, some abounding love that we've been talking about. It's not just enough for me, but some people don't even have enough for you. And you're trying to go around and give it to somebody else and wondering why life is always a struggle. At some point, and this is what's strange, people with recovery, and we deal with a lot of different people in recovery, They'll say, I feel like I'm being selfish right now. I feel like I'm being selfish because I, I can't go help them people. I can't go help my family. I, can't, I, I just got to be about me right now. I'm like, yeah, that's not selfish. You've got to get the, the cracks out of your own cup and get, them all, got, get God heal you so you've got something to carry. But if you continue trying to meet your needs by helping everybody else so it makes you feel better, then all you're going to do is you're going to continually be empty. And be filled. Pastor, heal me. Come to church just to heal me, thrill me, feel me. It's all about, why? Because you're so empty because you haven't got your own self fixed. And you're just trying to give out. I'm trying to take care of my family. Trying to be a good wife. Trying to be a good boss. Trying to be a good employee. And and the fact is you've not stopped long enough to say, wait a minute. I need to look at me. 
I need to confess. Get with somebody that knows how to pray. And say, Brother John, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling. I don't even love myself very much. Because when I look in the mirror, all I can see is my cracks. The cracks. I see the, those wrinkles. I see those ruts. The Lord is saying, I ne- you need to be healed. And it's all going to be, first of all, you've got to know that you're safe with me. You know, really and truly, none of us are completely safe with one another. Because all of us have faults and failures. Nobody is faithful completely except Jesus. Now, I don't want to get in my next week's message because I'm going to go into some of those things and why we have to have boundaries. But let me tell you, the first of all, we got to know what love looks like. And I'm not going to get very far into it today, but I want to I just whet your appetite. And I, I challenge you, if you've not been hearing these messages, go back and get on YouTube and find them. Or go to our website, ChristianGatheringChurch.com, and you can pick up our business card out in the front. Go to that website and spend some time, invest some time going, wait a minute, I need to be healed. I need to understand about this love thing. Where can I get to the place where I can have this enough security that I can receive the love of God and quit throwing up my defense and can't even receive it? We can sit in church, be singing about him, and we're just, it's bouncing off. This is what happened with Richard the day I talked about it. The day he came to my house and said, I receive y'all's love. I finally decided, in other words, I don't know what happened. After years, I was throwing love at him. I thought he was catching it, but he wasn't. He was just bouncing off. Why? Because he didn't, his glove was turned in. I, I, I don't, I'm not worthy. If they really knew me. If they knew my addiction. Why? Because he loved God for years, but still struggled with addiction. And there, for years, we don't feel safe enough to tell people that. And so our own addictions, our own problems, our own faults makes us feel unworthy of love. And so, therefore, we don't receive it because we feel unworthy. So that's why we have to preach grace so much and love so much. But let's talk. We're going to go into, I'm going to just read. I I was looking at this love thing, and I I realize there's people that love God. But then, why are they so messed up? Why are we still messed up when we, we, you know, when we, we love God? So many people. I always get worried with somebody, and they're dating somebody, and, you know, and I'll say, well, I said, are they Christian? Oh, they love God. Well, where's their church? Well, they don't really go to church, but they love God. Mm -hmm. They might be loving something here. Everybody says, I love God. Very few people just say, I hate God. I love God, yes. What does that mean to love God? What does it mean when your kids say, I love you, Mommy? What does it mean when when that man, the husband says to his wife, I love you? What does that mean? What does love mean? Well, God always gives us an example of what love is, and we've been talking about love is kind, all those things, but, but what I realize here is there's dimensions of love. There's different ways we love. Because the first commandment, Mark 12 and 30, and it's also in Matthew and different places, but he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Say, all thy heart. Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy mind. Say, all thy mind. And with all thy strength. And I missed one. With all thy soul. Four things. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Four ways to love. And what was interesting, they all said all. All your heart. All your soul, all your mind, all your strength. For this is the first commandment. And Mark says that this is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. In other words, all those years and all the sacrifices. And even today when we're sacrificing with praise and we're doing all these things, we sacrifice, I don't go out and do this. I'm giving this up for the Lord. We have these things we think sacrifice. He said, what I've desired more than all the sacrifices Everything, all I wanted was you to love me with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. That's all he ever wanted. That's why he created us, right? Was for relationship. We establish that all the time. We were not made just to serve him or to obey him or, you know, a trial or error and see if you go to heaven and go to hell or just to, you know, be a good person. No, we 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 were made for one reason. That's to love him back to receive that love and reciprocate that love. And out of that, I can't help but worship and serve and and to to do what he asked me to do. 
I can't help it. I want to do it. I was created for love. So all he ever wanted above everything is for me to love him with my all in four ways. And then he said, the second is likened to it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, everything else, everything in the whole up to this point, Jesus talking, everything in the law, everything in the prophets, everything hinges on those two things, loving God and loving people. And I remember I was teaching Sunday school years ago. I took a little coat hanger and I put, you know, this way here, love, and, and hung all those commandments on it. Every one of them go back to that. You see, if I love God, I'm not going to be worshiping any other gods. I'm not going to have any other gods before you. I'm not going to be out here doing, uh, having idols because I, I love God. There takes care of the first four or five commandments. The second is if I love people, I'm not going to be stealing from you. I'm not going to be killing you. I'm not going to be committing adultery on you. There's the rest of, the, of them. Everything hinges on love. See, it was a heart matter. But see, the problem was back in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Spirit of God in them. So what had to happen, he had to give them physical laws for them to obey to walk out love for people. Don't kill. In fact, it was eye for eye. You poke out somebody's eye and poke out your eye. Because why? They didn't have the heart yet. They had not got to the place where they had the Spirit within where you are. Now he said, I'm going to write my, my laws on your heart and in your mind. So we're in a different area. But really, it all comes down to these two things. How much do you love God? And it only depends on you can, how you can love other people is how much you receive the love of God. I'm going to tell you this. I, I think I put it on something about Facebook this week on a, 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 a couple that loves God first. That, that's, I can't quote it, but it was talking about you have better love when you love God first. Uh, it said a husband who will love God first will love you better. Well, he'll love you more. I mean, it's just the truth. There's something about the safety when someone's walking in the love of God, they have more to give. They don't have the cocoon around them. They don't have the walls around them. It took me years. I've been married to Gary 36 or 7 years. I forget which one our anniversary is this year. But really and truly, as much as we love, we had two children together. We had we multiple foster kids. We, we did all these things. But there was always a part of him I really couldn't get through. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There's just one area I just always felt like I couldn't get into. And it was, it was that fear. And later on, he said, I just always thought that if you really knew all these other things, that, that you would just think it was dumb or, or you would belittle it. Because he knew as a counselor, I worked with all kinds. And also as foster parents, we'd seen some really ugly, horrible things in life. And so he was downplaying his, I don't really want to tell you these things because, you know, it's not as bad as somebody else's. And, you know, you don't really want to display those things sometimes. It's vulnerability. Until he had the, a big one, <laughs> and everything shook up, and all of a sudden he, blah, 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 and he started telling me things, and, and whoa, why didn't you ever tell me these things before? I never knew that happened to you. I never knew those things. And he's, I don't know, I, I, what? He didn't really feel safe. And there's a process that happened in our marriage, in me, to the point where I could get, create the atmosphere that he could feel safe with me. First of all, I had to quit belittling him without even knowing I was. Because I started repeating what his mama was doing. I never made him feel good enough. If he worked on that and he fixed that, well, we hadn't fixed this yet. Your next off day, you need to work on this, how we can do this. What I didn't understand was how to honor my husband. And when I got into understanding the word and what it meant to really honor a man, I, released, I started releasing him to feel safe with me. And once Gary got over these things and let those walls down, now I'm telling y'all he is walking in a prophetic word like I can't even believe I'm married to this man. I said, I may be the preacher, but you're the prophet. I'm telling you, my husband is so amazing. I never knew this. What I'm telling you is that there's more to come. There's better to come. Don't you give up, and don't you try to make that person become. Because I kept trying, without even knowing it, I was trying to make Gary be like my daddy. Who, when my daddy got up, we come downstairs, he'd be sitting there with his Bible and his little notepad with his coffee. And because Gary didn't, didn't outly do all this godly man stuff I missed it and I know y'all hear me say this but I'm saying it for you because I want to encourage you these are the factual things this is what really matters we don't even know we're doing it we don't know when we're making somebody feel unsafe or they can't confess so that they can really be honest so they can receive the love of God they had to receive it from us but when I started honoring my husband all of a sudden um 
and he started breaking down those walls, and I'm not even going anywhere where I was going to go. But I see him now, that safety with him where he can, he came out the other day, and he said, uh, well, th- th- when's Friday morning, we were praying about serious, some serious things, and, and uh, we prayed together, and he got up and left the room. He came right back in. He said, the Lord just, he don't want really to say the Lord says, but he just said, uh, I'm just supposed to tell you that, that, that the Lord is saying that um, I am. I am. I, I, I am. And he said that when as soon as I said it, I am, then words started going in front of his face, just I am, I'm this, I'm this. He goes, it was like trying to get it, but I couldn't even get it. It was so fast. I couldn't write notes. But it was like any, it was like fast motion. In other words, anything you need, I am. And he said, and then the Lord said, I got this. I got this. So the situation, I was like, okay. You know, that man that got to that point to do this for me come because I made a safe environment when I started learning how to obey the word myself. And I quit trying to change him and make him like somebody else. Because he wasn't supposed to be like my daddy. He's supposed to be like Gary. He can be jokester. He, he, he can do all these things. He's just Gary. See, we try to make somebody into something we want them to be. Just work on yourself. When you change you, other people change in response. And when we got through that morning, I went that night. We had a funeral during the day. We went to, I was late to the women's thing. I get there, and they're singing and signing a song about what? What two words? I am. And, and Sister Linda had already told me, and I totally forgot it. She said, we're going to talk about what's impossible, that God is the I am in the impossible. The, the theme that night was I am. My husband didn't know that. The Holy Spirit knew that. And it wasn't just to let me know I am, but again, it confirmed what God, I, I couldn't wait to get home and wake him up and go, Gary, you are a prophet. <laughs> we're still amazed about it. <laughs> no, I'm, sorry. No, no, what I'm saying is God, he hears from God and can speak. When God puts you in a position, he put me and him in, he and I in, he will give you the equip, he'll equip you to do what he give you to do. Those he gives oversight, he gives insight. So don't be surprised. When, when you come to us and God just gives me something, I'm surprised. I don't know why, when I'm going to quit being surprised. That God will just speak to me just like, exactly what you need, Jan. It's amazing. God gives insight to those he gives oversight. In other words, anything he's going to give you responsibility of, he's going to help you to be able to take care of it. He'll give you the ability for the responsibility. He'll give you the ability for the responsibility. So we've been talking, how can I love people? How can I love my enemies? How can I love those who despitefully used you? That's another, you need to go back and listen to it. Because he will give you the ability to whatever he's given you the responsibility to do. And he gave us the responsibility, Paul said, oh, no man but to love him. And so if you're having a hard time loving people or loving God, obeying these two commandments right here, then you need to go to him because he will give you the ability to do it supernaturally. So what does it look like to love him with your heart? That's probably the only one I'm going to get to today, but to love him with your heart. What is that word right there? It is the center of self. It's the core of my innermost being. The heart. The heart is not just, it's not so much what I'm doing, but it's where I'm doing it from. It's a position. The heart is the core of who I am. See, we think we fall in love. I, I thank God I didn't marry some of the guys I thought I was in love with. Whew, thank you for unanswered prayers. Because at that point, whew, get a hand there. Don't everybody start shouting at once. Because the truth is, there's a feeling that we think is love. But there's a difference. I can tell you There are people that you can love, and you can go on and have other loves, but when it's real love from that core, you never stop loving that person. Divorce don't stop it. Death don't stop it. Sometimes abuse don't stop it. That's what makes it so hard. It's when you really get to the point where you give your heart. It is forever. Because it goes into the spirit of you. This one we got to be very careful. He said, guard your hearts. But thank God, most of the time we think we're in love, we're really not. It didn't go that deep. It was love here, your mind, another one of those places. Or even, it was a body thing. 
it was a sexual attraction. It was a, a, a whatever. But it, it, was a, it was something that did not go to the heart. And so many times that's what people marry on and make commitments on, but they haven't really got to the heart of the matter. So let me give you some scriptures about heart. Second Corinth Chronicles 16 and 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Now, that didn't mean you're a perfect person. That word perfect means holy, completely. They said, Lord, it's me and you forever. My heart is yours. And whoever else you want to bring into my life, into my heart, if you want to give me a spouse, you want to give me children, you want to give me a, a pet, there's people that love their pets with all their heart and you agree. And I know what that's like. We prayed over so many lost cats and hurt dogs and, and all those things. Why? Because we can love. You find the perfect match. They found, finally found the perfect match dog for y'all, didn't you? Dusty is the perfect match for these two bachelors over here. The first two just didn't work. But all of a sudden, you find your, what is your cat, uh, Carol, we just prayed? Buffy. You find your Buffy. And it's a heart thing. He said, I'm looking for people to show myself strong on those whose heart is toward me. Let me tell you something. God don't like two-timing. See, I used to think where the scripture talks about if you're lukewarm, he'd spew you out of his mouth, you're the hot or cold. Now, I thought that meant like I'm going to be fired up for God. But the minute I got a little cold, well, he's going to puke me up. I'm not saved today. I'm only saved when I'm, whoa, thank you, Jesus, I'm quoting the scripture. No. What that, what that lukewarm is, is when your heart, you're wavering. That's, a, that's like a wave that wavers. Is there a God? Oh, now that doesn't mean, let me give you this, it doesn't mean that you don't have doubt sometime. I guarantee there's some times I doubted if I love Gary. And I guarantee there's some times he doubted he loved me. <laughs> but see, that's where another depth with your mind, because love, like the old song says, is more than a feeling. Love has got to be more than a feeling because feelings are going to come and go, not only about each other and your, even your spouses, but I'll tell you what, it's even going to come and go with God sometime. You don't always just feel like, oh, I'm just so in love with Jesus. But then there's that second level, which we hadn't got to, which is your mind. You've got to love him with all four legs of that table. See, four is the foundational number. It's north, south, east, and west. It's the four corners of the earth. So this is a cornerstone. Love has got to have, it's got three levels, body, soul, spirit, but it's four, four corners it's sitting on. It's solid. You can't just love with your heart. And you can't just love with your mind. And you can't just love with your soul. And you can't just love with your strength. But you need to know what those are. Because you might be loving one area, not loving another. Now, let me just tell you this. The reason why I really got into this blew my mind. 1 Kings 3 and 3, Solomon said he showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given to him by his father, David. Did Solomon love God? We just said it. Solomon loved, and Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking. And what's walking? We learned it last week. It's to make progress in one's way, to make use, do use of opportunities to regulate your life, to conduct yourself. He conducted himself. He walked according to the instructions given him by his father David. He loved God, it says, and he did these things. But then it says, except. Oops. It's like that, but. Except he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. You know what that means? He was out worshiping other gods. How could you love him walking in his ways, but over here, except he went over here, he became a two-timer. At one point, the Lord said, he, he said, I divorced Israel because of her adulterous ways. Israel, the nation. Yes, God was a divorcee. Y'all believe that? I wrote a pamphlet one time. 
for all my people that's been through divorce that got, feel like they got shamed out of churches. God was a divorcee. He said, I divorced Israel because of your adultery. In other words, you went, he said, you went whoring after other gods is what the King James says. They love God, but then they want to run over here and now we're going to, okay, but now we're going to go over here. We need some rain, so we're going to go worship the rain God. We're going to run over here and we're going to pray to, pray to Zeus today. And we're going to go over here and pray to, because what, they kept being fickle in who they had fell in love with. God is not going to put up with fickle about who you committed your life to. He'll be fickle feelings. Oh, I tell you, I'm feeling, it's not about your feelings. Sometimes I just feel so in love and God loves me. Sometimes I just feel like he's holding me, but I don't know if I really feel it or not. There's nothing wrong with that. That's because we're humans. But let me tell you what's got to be solid is I sell out to you. At some point, you're going to give your heart to him. A lot of people gave their life. They're like him. Oh, I'm walking the ways of God. I'm going to church on Sunday. I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can to make grandma think up, make me proud, they're her proud, all these things. But at some point in this thing, the first commandment was love me with all your heart. At some point, you're going to say, it's me and you. I love you because you first loved me. And you held me and you loved me when I didn't even feel it, when I didn't know it. And I turned to other people, other men, other women, other things, other job or money or new relationship. I turned to other things to make me feel important and loved. But you still loved me. You never left me. Because now he's never going to divorce you. The what he said is because now by my blood I come and took care of all that. When I look at you, I don't care how much you've been. Do I still love you and I will never leave you or forsake you. He forsook, he turned his back on Israel in the back in the Old Testament. But you know what he did? He still loved her so much, he went back. And he remarried her. He said, oh, could God do that? Yes, God. Oh, you need to read about this God. He's not the God sometimes we think he is. The emotions we have, it's in us, we all got them from, we got them from God. Every emotion, God's a very emotional God. Oh, let me tell you something. Start reading it. Every emotion we have, we got them from him. I love it. So that's why we can be in this relationship with him. We can walk and talk with him. He understands the feelings of our weaknesses, he said. I get it. I've come down and lived and walked in a fleshly body for three and a half, 32 and a half years. I understand what it's like to be betrayed. I understand what it feels like to be jealous. He said, God's over with you a jealous, I'm a jealous God. Now, that doesn't mean like insane jealousy. That means protective. You messing with my babies? I'm right there. You mess with my woman, I'm right there. That's my church. She's my wife. Satan, don't you become messing with my woman. She may not look like the best thing all the time, but she's mine. <laughs> and I gave my life for her. I bought her with a terrible price. He loves us. In spite of ourselves, he loves us. We're a part of a bride. My fingernail not, may not look real great, but it'd be hooked on my body, and you're not even really looking at it. See, all of us together, we all flawed. But the truth is we're one body, and we all make up for each other's weaknesses and strengths. That's how it's supposed to be. And not only that, he said love covers a multitude of sins. So as we love each other, I'm telling you, it just covers everything. And when he looks at us, he sees this beautiful spotless bride without spot or wrinkle. He said, I did that. I prepared you for myself. I can't make myself without spot or wrinkle. Yeah, I can try to live the best life I can, but when it comes down to it, he's the one that's going to have to make me spotless and wrinkles. He's going to present to himself, he said, a spotless bride. He will do it for me. But all he asks from me is, first of all, be my bride. Say, I do. I do. Forever I do. I vow. I say my vows to you. I love you with my heart. I'm giving you my heart. And some people do that, but they never got the rest of them. We're going to talk about them because it's not just about loving God with your heart. You've also got to love him with your mind and your soul and your strength. And what is strength? Oh, we're going to talk about that. I have commanded you today to love the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. Keep his commands, his decrees and laws, and you will live and you will have increase. And the Lord your God will bless you. Wow. How do I get that? Walk in his ways. Walk in obedience. Keep his commandments, his decrees and laws. Why? It's all a bunch of those thou shalt. No. Don't steal so you don't become a thief. Don't kill so you're not set on death row. 
the thou shalt, the rules are just for you to have a good life. Does anybody really want to be a thief and a murderer and an adulterer? I don't. I don't have to worry about those thou shalt. I just don't want to be those things. And if you do that, he told them back, this was back in the Old Testament, he said, just do these things and you'll have a good life. And I tell people all the time, I, said, if you just, I used to tell those boys, I wrote a, a curriculum called the Big Ten. I said, if you just followed the Ten Commandments, son, if you just followed those things, because they didn't really get the love yet, because if they had love, they wouldn't have to have any commandments, because they'd already do it out of their heart. But I said, son, if you just lived your life and did those little ten things, ten, the ten was the tithe. It was ten of all the laws. And you kept the ten, you kept them all. But if you broke one of the ten, he said you broke them all. Oh, that's a little right there. That's that tithe again. Now we're going to get to that. But he said, I used to tell him, if you would just do that, you won't be locked up. They're, not, they're locking you up for things in the, in the Ten Commandments. I said, son, you want to live free? You want to have a happy life? Happy wife, happy life, and all that stuff? You get in here because God's commands, they're not grievous. They're good for us. They're the boundaries to show me how to give a, get a good life. You will live and you will increase. In Joshua, he said, walk, love the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. Keep his commands. Hold fast to him. There's that holding. Hold fast to him. Serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. Deuteronomy, he said, love the Lord your God, walk in his ways and cleave to him. It means hold on to him with your heart. I will praise you, Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth your marvelous works. And in the assembly of the upright, in the congregation, that's what, that's what Jennifer just did. That's what you would do when you were singing. Psalms 119, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and seek him with their whole heart. The more I seek you, the more I find you. The more I find you, the more I love you. Psalms said, I have, with my whole heart, I sought after you that I wouldn't wander from your commandments. I don't want to keep getting off track, Lord, and doing that loser loop. I'm tired of being on the loser loop, losing love, losing money, losing relationships, losing my health, losing my freedom, losing my money. I sought you with my whole heart. Some of y'all have been half-hearted. And the areas that you're half-hearted, you don't get those blessings till you get to the point where you get wholehearted in that area. You may be wholehearted in some areas, but you need to be, become all your heart. I sought you that I wouldn't wander from your commandments. Psalms 119.34, give me understanding that I'll keep your law, yea, I'll observe it with my whole heart. Ephesians 5, walk in love, for Christ has loved us and given himself for us as an offering. Walk in love. Love him with your heart today. Do you love him with your whole heart? Have you said, I do, and then you didn't? I do. The song that says, falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I ever did. hear my mother saying that she says I was a little girl 12 years old my grandparents never went to church they were a good hard working farm family but they just didn't go to church the dead at Civil's Bend way out there and she went to church a friend invited her to a little revival she said I was 12 years old and I fell in love with Jesus she wrote a song called Falling in Love with Jesus. I fell in love with Jesus. She said it changed everything. When you really fall in love, it'll change. Y'all know it'll mess with everything. You mess up, it'll mess everything. Man, you just, you, you just, when a man loves a woman, he'll turn his back, back on his best friend. I love that song, sorry. I can't think. Oh, I'll tell you, it just, it's just, when you fall in love, you will just sell out. If I had to move. Bobby, it's just, I don't know how the wheels are still in his car driving to Robin's house. He 
He said, I didn't get a second job, just pay for the gas. I think, I don't know. When you fall in love with Jesus, an hour is not too long to drive to the church where you feel like you can display and receive the love of Jesus through his people. There's no price too great. Do you love him today? Young people, do you love him? That's where it comes down to. Because when you love somebody, you don't want to betray them. When you love him, it matters what people think about you because you said, I'm a Christian. I'm representing the family name. I had people that was representing gangs. Man, they, I mean, I tell you, if you was a blood, you wouldn't put on something blue on your body for nothing because it's representing. But I see Christians represent the name of Jesus and they just put anything on their life, in their life. They forget who they're representing. Some of y'all been more committed to jobs or people or all kind of stuff than you've been committed to him. Seek him with your whole heart and you will not give yourself to another. We're going to end up talking about Solomon, what happened to him. He loved God, but then he turned. I just Googled his name this morning. I said, Solomon. It's a sad tale, a moral sad tale. He was the son of a king. And he started out great. And when he received the kingdom, he said, God, what I want from you, I want wisdom how to lead your people. That's what, he didn't just ask for wisdom in general. He said, I want wisdom how to deal with your people. If I'm going to be their king, I want the wisdom to do it. And God said, because you've not asked for riches and fame, because you asked to take care of my babies, I'm not only going to give you wisdom, and you're going to be the wisest man. There'll be nobody when he handles business and handling relationships and handling kingdom. Nobody's going to be wiser before you or after you. He said, and also, you're going to have riches, and you're going to have fame with it. We all know King Solomon. Because of, he asked for the right thing. His heart was right. But somewhere along the line, he did just like the tree. The Bible talks about the four types of ground. The hard one, the ground. The last one where he said, uh, the next to the last where he said, there was a fruitful tree, but all of a sudden it got wrapped around some vines, cares of this life, and the love of riches. Choked them out. Choked out the love. Choked out the fruit. It started off, it still looked like a tree. Still had green leaves on it, but it didn't have any fruit. You can look like a Christian, but there's no fruit. You've lost your love. You lost your joy. You lost your peace. All of a sudden, you're not so long-suffering with those kids. You're not so gentle with that spouse or the people at work. He told the people in Corinthians uh, and, and Revelation, he says, I have somewhat against you. You do all these great things. You hate evil. You do all these things. But I have something against you that you lost your first love. That's where he becomes first, your first First, do you love him first?